geosynchronous and geostationary orbits. Let me just go ahead and start off with the demo of geosynchronous orbits and geostationary, importantly, because they are used in everyday life, probably, in a lot of places. Okay, here's my globe. It's not mine, but. And then imagine that I have an object orbiting the Earth. Well, we've already seen that the further you get from the Earth, the lower the rotational, the, the orbital period, how long it takes to orbit. We did that with Kepler's laws, um, and it works for the Earth and an object too. So, but the Earth also rotates. So what if you were able, and I'm going to use the United States here, what if you were able to have a satellite right here that orbited at the same rate that the Earth rotated like that then as viewed from the earth this satellite would always be in the same position it would be in the same position in the sky relative to the earth it would move with respect to the background stars it'd move with respect to the sun but it'd be in the same location why do you care about that well that actually is pretty useful because suppose i want to have a communication satellite maybe even to get tv well, I can have my satellite up here broadcast stuff, but I need to point my my antenna, my parabolic dish antenna, at the same spot in the sky. And that's how you'd put your uh, satellite TV up there and just point your satellite there, and it doesn't have to move. You don't have to track it. It doesn't go on the other side of the Earth. You always have it visible. Another uh, option would be to have a weather satellite. Let's say I want to always look at the United States. Well, I could put this weather satellite in geostationary orbit and always be looking at the Earth no matter what time of the day it is because they rotate together. Now, geosynchronous means that the orbital periods are the same. So it's possible that you could have the Earth rotating and this going over the pole, right? And then it would come back to the same location in one orbit one day. But if you put it over the equator, then, then you have the same axis of rotation for the two, and that's a geostationary orbit. If you look uh, at a house, with satellite dish on it for TV, it's pointing south-ish because, well, in the northern hemisphere, because those geostationary orbits are above the equator, so you have to point south. Okay, but let's calculate that distance. Now that we had a little bit fun with the globe, um, yeah, there's, there's some other cool globe questions I could ask, but, but they're not related to geostationary orbits. Okay, so let's just start from scratch. I have a satellite uh, of mass M orbiting at an uh, altitude or orbital radius of R. I'll calculate the altitude in a little bit. The altitude is, is the height above the ground. Okay, so in this case, I only have the gravitational force acting on it, so let's draw our free body diagram. It looks like this, Fg. I use big G for the real gravitational force and then F little g for gravitational force on the surface of the Earth. And that's the only force acting on it. And so I can pick this as my x-axis. I'm actually going to pick this as my positive x-axis. There's nothing wrong with that. But I drew my picture like this, so I'm going to pick that as my positive x-axis. Now I can write F net in the x direction. is going to be this force, which is G, mass of the Earth, mass of the satellite, over R squared. And that's going to be equal to the mass times acceleration. But if it's moving in a circular orbit, the acceleration is v squared over r. But in this case, I don't really care about the velocity, right? I don't care what the velocity of this is. I care about its rotation rate because I want them to rotate the same. So since v equals omega times r, this is the angular velocity, I can substitute this in and I get m omega squared times r, and that's a little bit easier. So this is the angular velocity of the satellite as it orbits, and I want that to be equal to the angular velocity of the Earth. So uh, let's just start with that. So I have to put that up here. No, first of all, the mass cancels. I want to solve for r. So I'm going to multiply both sides by r squared, and I, yeah, so I get omega squared r cubed g mass of the earth right because this mass cancels with that now i'm going to divide both sides by omega and i get r cubed equals g mass of the earth 
over omega squared. Now we have to find omega. And we could just look it up, but I don't want to do that. So let's calculate omega. Omega is equal to uh, 2 pi radians divided by how long? Remember, omega is delta theta over delta t. So I know in one rotation of the Earth, it rotates 2 pi radians, and it takes one day. Now, in the problem I said this, it actually takes less than a day to rotate. Um, there's this thing about solar day versus sidereal day. This is a solar day. This is how long it takes for the sun to get back in the same spot. But which, since the Earth's orbiting the sun, the time it takes to rotate with respect to the background star is a little bit different. But let's just use that. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So now I need to convert days to seconds because my G and my R's are in meters and seconds. Well, I can say one day is 24 hours. And then I can convert hours to seconds. And one hour is 60 minutes times 60 seconds. So that's 3,600 seconds. So the hours cancel, days cancel, and I get omega. Let's go ahead and calculate our value for omega. It does come up every once in a while. Turn on the calculator. Drop 2, enter, pi times 24 divided by 3,600 divided by. And I get 7. 0.27 times 10 to the negative fifth uh, radians per second. Now I can put that in here and calculate R. Um, so I know the mass of the Earth is 5.972 times 10 to the 24th. The radius of the Earth we're not going to use just yet. Uh, and then G is that. So I can put uh, R is going to be equal to G 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th, times the mass of the Earth, five, five, that's a times, let's put this like that, 5.972 times 10 to the 24th, divided by omega squared, 7.27 times 10 to the negative fifth, squared, and then all of that to the one third power. Okay, so we've got a lot of work to do with our calculator here. Make sure that you practice that and you can do it right because there's a very good chance that you can make a mistake. Um, I'm just going to drop that and start over. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Enter. 5.972 times 10 to the 24th times. Now I need to square that. 7.27 times 10 to the negative 5th. Enter. Squared. Yeah. Divided by. And then I need to raise it to the one third power or take it the cubed root. If you have a cubed root button, I actually have a I have a X to the Y button. Okay, and I, I don't remember if, if this goes, I think I'm gonna do three and then X, Y, but it might be backwards. Okay, that's right. So I'm pretty sure. So I get R can't see. I get R four point two two times ten to the two four two four six seven. Now I want to calculate this value of H, the altitude. H is just going to be equal to R minus the radius of the Earth. So that's going to be 4.22 times 10 to the 7th. Notice that that is larger than the radius of the Earth, so that's good. Um, but that's that. So 4.22 times 10 to the 7th minus uh, the radius of the Earth, 6.37 times 10 to the 6th. And I get 6.37 times 10 to the 6th minus, I get 3.8. 5, 8, 5, 9, 5, 9 times 10 to the, I think it's 7, 2, 4, yeah, 7. There you go. That's your orbital, that's your orbital altitude, how far above the surface of the Earth you need for these geosynchronous orbits. It is far away. Okay, they are far away. 
There is another fun question that I'm not going to do. But there's another uh, way that you might want a geostationary orbit. I'm going to go ahead and tell you about it. And that's with a, uh, a space elevator. So in a space elevator, you want to have something much closer to the surface of the Earth. Say right here. If I want to have it right down here, but still be in geostationary orbit so it's in the same location, I could do that by essentially connecting a cable between the surface of the Earth and that object. So if I have some, if this is a lot closer, <clears throat> the cable's going to have to pull in order to have the net force on this uh, equal to such that it has an accel uh, acceleration of m omega squared r. And that's the idea of a space elevator. The higher up you have it, uh, the less force you would need, but that's one way to do it. Another way would to put the geostationary orbit, the, the space elevator way up here at a geostationary orbit or close to it. But the problem is, and then you have a super long cable. Okay, so there, space elevators would be cool because you could just slowly move up to uh, orbit. But the idea of building that kind of a long cable is kind of crazy because the cable itself would have mass. But this is a whole different story, and we can talk about that later. We were just talking about geosynchronous and geostationary orbits, which are real. The end.